good morning. God is with you. My name's Andrea Irwin, one of the ministers here. And I'm John Pentland, another minister here. Glad you are here among us. Welcome. Thank you, Joel, for accompanying us this morning. Always lovely to hear you play. Thank you. Speaking of Joel, there was a whole group. If you were here Friday night, just put your hand up a little bit, if you don't mind. There were some singers. What did Joel play? Con sang. Oh, oh, it was amazing here Friday evening, about 80, 100 people here, and the people popping out of the pews that we had no idea had great gifts like Joel just offered. What a great evening Friday was. So thanks to the music people and all who put that together. Uh, we have uh, four core practices, hospitality. I can say today, the coffee is hot, the coffee is ready, the coffee is fantastic. And so you're most welcome to it throughout the service as a way of tasting hospitality. Uh, the second is spirituality, opportunities to deepen your soul life. Um, we are doing this in real theology, this, this uh, Lenten practice of looking at a movie uh, and the theology of it. But soul practice is an opportunity to deepen your soul life. Third is social justice. How do we take the things we say and saying and actually put legs and hands and feet and voice on them in the world? That's social justice. And the fourth is risk. We are an affirming community of faith. This banner and the ones outside say to the world, you belong whoever you are, wherever you're at, regardless of age, stage, gender, identity, religious or not, you belong. And we hope that uh, you feel that way in this service. If you don't, please let us know because we want you to feel like you belong. The land that Hillhurst United Church is located on, some of you were born on, some of you are just visiting today, and some of you, like myself, chose to call this place home, but long before any of us were on this land, it was stewarded by the Blackfoot Confederacy, that's the Siksika, the Pekani, and the Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, the Chiniki, the Bearspaw, and the Good Stony people, along with the Métis people of Alberta. And so remembering this is one of the ways that we actively live into peace and truth and reconciliation. So we are grateful to be here in this place. I love the sound of that. I mean, yeah, it's hissing. kind of anointing, but it's really helpful. If you're cold, you're welcome to go cuddle up to them. We, We've been doing that this morning. We, the we have. Here. The radiators are nice and warm. Do not burn a hole through the bottom of your pants. Yeah, exactly. Been there, done that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, tonight is Chapel Arts. I don't know if, these, if there is a slide, but there, there is. Tonight, five o'clock. This is an opportunity in the Heritage Room in a circle with a smaller community uh, to experience uh, Chapel Arts, how arts and theology go together in a one-hour opportunity uh, offered by our contemplative community. I can recommend that. I'll be there. Yes, we also this afternoon, uh, following the second worship service, have our congregational budget meeting. So if that is something that interests you, please be there. If it's something that doesn't interest you, please be there. You are welcome to join us online as well. Uh, we'll be live streaming it. It won't be Zoom. So there will be an opportunity for you to engage with questions, um, but we'll go through all the details when you, uh, when you join us for that. Starting next Sunday, following the service, for people 12 to 18 years of age who have registered ahead of time, we'll be offering confirmation classes. So this is an opportunity for teens to re-explore their faith, what it means uh, to ask some hard questions, to dive in and to share a meal together. So that'll be every Sunday throughout the season of Lent, starting next Sunday uh, starting 12.15ish uh, and going until 2 o'clock. So come and chat with me or visit the website for details on that. So real theology. I'm not sure if there is a slide. There it is. So we're taking a different movie each week, and today is American Fiction. Next week is uh, Andrea. What's next week? Oh, next week is Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, it is a, uh, a very important movie, a heavy movie, one I hope that you watch, but it's also three hours. So if it takes you two days, this is uh, ample warning to get started on that this week. A great movie, and tomorrow night online, a conversation about that. Mm -hmm. And then I think we invite June Churchill to come forward. June, sit to the back with Gord, and she has an important announcement about an upcoming event. And there's a microphone. Thanks, June. Hello, three women from our congregation are part of a play that was created by Carolyn Pogue and um, 
we are going to put it on, on in Hillhurst on March 5th. That's a Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And it's called Patriarchy on Trial. And it's not a man-bashing event. We're inviting adults and teens to attend. It's really about how patriarchy is suppressing many of us in our society still. And so it's humorous, there's music, it's uh, in a skit form, and we invite you to attend. There's no charge, but we'd like donations to cover our expenses. And it's also happening at three other churches during the first week in March, at Woodcliffe, at the Unitarian Church, and at Knox. And uh, the Knox one is a Sunday afternoon, so that makes it very accessible. And we'd... Um, I'll leave this post, I'll bring this poster up to the front and you can take a picture if you're interested in the other locations and dates. But ours will be Tuesday, March 5th. Thank you. So as always, there is plenty going on in this community and we hope that you are finding a way to connect as it relates to things that you're interested in. Uh, conversations you want to have, um, and uh, if you didn't hear something in that list, uh, you can visit our website as there is always plenty happening. As we gather, we light this candle in our midst to remind ourselves that God is present in all that we experience, in all that we see and feel and hear. And we say these words together. Once there was someone who said such wonderful things and did such amazing things that people began to follow him. And one day they asked him who he was and he responded, I am the light. Friends, let's stand and sing our opening hymn. Welcome people who are online somewhere in the world and you've tuned in to us and we welcome you to this place and encourage you to greet each other. And in this place, we come sometimes for the very first time, perhaps nervous, perhaps wondering what might happen. Others perhaps a little bit more comfortable in this place. And we trust that the Spirit will awaken, stir, hold, shield, and help us on our journey. And some people have, are just hanging by a thread this week. They've had bad news or struggle about their own life or another's. 
And others are so full of good news, they can't wait to tout you. So we sit in this place and we are connected by the Spirit and we give thanks for that. And so I invite you to join with me in a few words and then enter into your own silence, your own prayer, as we step more fully into this second Sunday of Lent. Please join me. Spirit of light, as we gather, we bring our very selves. We confess our humanness. We open our hearts to your transforming love. In silence, we open. Some bring confession, things we need to let go of. Some gratitude for someone or something. Some bring concern for ourselves or others. We rest in the sound of the song and the radiator and the peace of this place. settle in this place. We bring our truest selves to this place, seeking to remember we are beloved, seeking to remember we are held, seeking to remember you know us before a word is on our tongue, you love us already. We come, some not forgiving ourselves. May you wash over us that we may know you forgive us and help us to forgive ourselves. Some of us come bringing the weight of worry or wonder. May this service soften and awaken us so that we might step more fully into the world just as we are. And so we offer our prayers and then we gather them together in the song Jesus invited us to live, the Lord's Prayer. A friend once when I said to him, why do you go to church? He paused and he simply said, I go to remember. I step into worship to be reminded who I am and whose I am. And in a sense, that's what worship is all about, to remind us who we are, to explore that, to wonder, and whose we are as a beloved child of God. So know this and remember this from the beginning page to the last page of this book. We are reminded we are loved, forgiven, and set free. The only problem with that is we don't believe it. It's me too, sometimes. But I invite you to dare to believe that we are loved, we are forgiven, and we're set free. And when we own it and live it, the world is transformed, and we run and walk and dance in the world with love. So know this, 
We are loved, forgiven, and set free. Dare to believe it. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks for that music. At this uh, point in our service, it's a liturgical um, passage of break. And in this uh, time, it's an opportunity to do several things. Uh, one is to uh, come forward to place your prayer if you would like. And, and you can do this. Uh, you've been given a sheet of purple paper, have you? 
yeah, to place it in here, which we will uh, not look at, but it's an opportunity of confession or Lent that will be burned on, at our Easter vigil. You're welcome to come to light a candle. You're welcome to do a traditional offering or a more modern offering, an opportunity for great food. Uh, kid space people will be at the back that will take any children who'd like to be together with other children. And most of all, it's an opportunity to greet those around you and simply by putting hands together or a bump to look them in the eye and wish them wholeness or wellness by simply saying, peace be to you. So peace be to you as we come to this break. Peace be to you. Well, good morning. I have another refrain for us to start to take into our bodies today. It's pretty simple. There's only a couple of lines. So the words will come up. They're up there. But you may not even need them. And I'll invite you to almost ignore them unless you need them. Because that's all. But it's the spirit in me greets the spirit in you. Alleluia. God's in us and we're in God Alleluia. We're just going to sing it through a whole bunch of times until we feel like we know it together.
Greg, can you help us out? more and this time you probably know those words now can you look at somebody and sing to somebody if you're comfortable try it we'll do it twice <laughs> As we entered into worship this morning, we are each arriving here in a different way. Some of us have come from a place of great joy and we are overflowing and others of us are on, as some of the youth might say, the struggle bus as we are here today. However you have arrived, we're grateful you have. And we bring at this time all of those voicings of the prayers that might be deep within us. This could be a prayer of gratitude or celebration. This could also be a prayer of grief or longing or heartbreak, a prayer for the world or a prayer for someone near and dear to you, perhaps a prayer for yourself. Some of us name these out loud and others hold them tight to ourselves, but at this time in our worship, we hold them all together. So let's gather ourselves and draw ourselves into prayer with the words of our prayer refrain this morning, O oh God, we call. Let's sing. that we might have the ears to hear one another, the wisdom to be in conversation that matters, the hearts meant to open. For the arms and family as they prepare today to celebrate the life of, of their son and brother, Jonathan, who died Thank you. recently. Prayers for those who knew and loved Jonathan as they prepare to celebrate his life. Thank you. 
Prayers of gratitude. Thank you for those who give their time to communities such as this, for those who give their lives to work that is ordained by God to those who serve in any way that they may feel called. Prayers of gratitude for all those who open themselves up to work in health services, those who teach, those in leadership. Prayers of wisdom, prayers for responsibility. Prayers for all those who join us in an online space and who request prayers that way. And prayers for all those who hold that community of people in prayer every week. Children living in fear. Yeah. Prayers for the children all over the world who are living in fear. Prayers for David's nephew who passed away this week. Prayers of gratitude for friends we haven't seen in a while. Continued prayers for Gaza and Ukraine because uh, things aren't looking good on either front. Yeah. Prayers for Gaza, prayers for Ukraine, prayers for all of the places in this world that are experiencing horrendous violence and immense unrest the kind that seems unstoppable. Prayers for those who are feeling the darkness with deep anxiety and depression. May they experience the light of spring too. We gather all of these prayers that are spoken aloud in this place and the prayers that remain in our hearts with the words of this prayer refrain. great mystery, eternal love. All the names that we call you, all the ways we address you show just how known and yet unknowable you are to us. We are filled with language And we do our best to use that language to express how we feel, what we long for, what we hope for. We call this prayer. And yet our language can only take us so far. It never quite gets at what our heart is saying. But God, you do before we were born, before we were even imagined, you knew us. You formed us. You were with us in the before and you are with us in the after. And you are with us all the journey long. You know us. Whether we can speak to how we know you, whether we can voice our truest prayers, you hear them exactly as we hope you would hear them. And sometimes all we can do is hold silence and make space for you to dwell 
in all the places within us that we are not sure how to lift up. So God, we hold that space now. Hear this silence as our deepest prayer. We sing these ancient words together. of your people. Amen. Good morning. Today's readings have been selected from Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Matthew, Hebrews, and Galatians. First, from Leviticus chapter 19, verse 33. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. Now from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. God executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and God loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. And Matthew chapter 25, verse 35. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Hebrews 13, verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing that, some have entertained angels without knowing it. And finally, Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. May we heed these words in our daily lives. Amen. Thank you, Pam. Uh, I'm going to invite us to uh, see the trailer for uh, American Fiction. How many people saw this movie? Are there anybody in this room? A few of us. Great. Okay. It was playing last week at the Plaza. I don't know if it's still playing down the street, but nonetheless, we'll carry on now. I just got a heads up. There's the, the F-bomb gets dropped a lot. I think we've dubbed it enough. Um, but anyway, if you've never heard that word before, we can talk after. Um, <laughs> But here's the, here's the trailer. How did you come to write this book? What really struck me was that too few books were about my people. Where are our stories? Where's our representation? Would you give us the pleasure of reading an excerpt? Yo, Sharonda, girl, you be pregnant again? If I is, Ray Ray is gonna be a real father this time around.
your books are good, but they're not popular. Editors, they want a black book. They have a black book. I'm black, and it's my book. You know what I mean. Look at what they published. Look at what they expect us to write. I just want to rub their noses in it. <laughs> I'd be standing outside in the night. Deadbeat dads, rappers, crack. You said you wanted black stuff. That's black, right? I see what you're doing. We sold your book. No. We believe Mr. Lee has written a bestseller. It's a joke. The most lucrative joke you've ever told. Now, is Stag a pseudonym? Yeah. Mr. Lee can't use his real name. Is this based on your actual life? Yeah, you think some bitch-ass college boy can come up with that shit? No, no. No, I don't. Can I ask what you were in for? Was it murder? Yeah, you said that, not me. They ran 300,000 copies. Your books changed people's lives. They're offering $4 million for the movie rights. Yes! The dumber I behave, the richer I get. Stag Arley is still on the run for authorities. You haven't done anything. It's not like they can arrest you. Yeah. Wish I could go back to not selling books. Is it bad to cater to people's tastes? People want to love you, Monk. You should let them love all of you. There's already so much buzz because of the movie deal. Michael B. Jordan is circling. We want to put him on the cover in one of those um, uh, scarves, I guess you would call them, tied around his head. A do-rag? Do-rag, that's it. Do rag in a tank top with the muscles showing. Ooh, something called the fire department. <laughs> We're thinking we can get it out in time for Juneteenth. Okay, and I've asked Gord Churchill, who uh, I, he, all I know is he loved the movie, so I'm going to invite him to say something about the movie, and then we'll dive in together. I think there's a mic there. I told John last Sunday that I hoped he was going to preach on this movie, and he is. I'm going to be fascinated to see what he says. Me too. You too, yeah. I've been a semi-professional storyteller for a number of years, and one of the first things I learned as a storyteller is the phrase, show, don't tell. In other words, by the sequence of the actions in the story make your point. And the second thing I learned about storytelling is that a storyteller may well tell you what a story is about, but it may not be what they show you. For instance, the story Little Red Riding Hood, if you listen to it, is a cautionary tale for young, innocent girls about wolves. <laughs> but tell that story a bunch of times, and you become aware that the story shows you that innocent young girls' best allies are older women who create a diversion for the wolf so she can get away and tells the woodcutter what's going on. That's a very different point to the story. When I went to see American fiction, in the intro, I thought to myself that this is about a professor who is having his free speech impinged by correct thinking. And I thought, well, that's interesting. Let's see what they do with that. In the last minute of the movie, I realized that this was a movie about the stereotypes and tropes that we carry in our head that make it hard for us to hear what is being said to us. Stories of black oppression and poor black southern scenarios precondition us to not hear 
other stories. In this case, a northern black experience of a professor who is teaching in California and grew up in Boston. And those stories that he tells are very much like the northern white stories that I hear. Great, great similarities. This movie left me thinking hard and laughing at myself. and all the stereotypes that I carry in my head. I'm trying hard not to tell you what the last minute of the movie is about, which was such a surprise that I found myself belly laughing out loud. And since I have tried to open my ears to hear, not just what's in my head, but what's being said. Aha is a moment in this movie that can only be shown, not told. Thank you. That is good, because I don't plan on telling in this uh, sermon, but inviting you to hear and see for yourself. Let's pray. Okay, thanks for the stories that have shaped our lives, the stories we have read or seen or know. Okay, thanks for the stories we've got to unlearn and relearn as we are a people of story. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our heart be received and acceptable and shaped by your love for us. Amen. Thank you, Gord. Excellent to invite us into this listening. So last week, if you were here, I was talking about real theology and someone asking me whether we were doing real theology because it was trendy, fun, challenging, and necessary, a connection to culture, and I said, yes, it is all of that. It is all of that. It is trendy, fun, challenging, necessary, and a connection to culture. And I said that it's like holding the iPhone in one hand and the Bible in the other, or a movie in one hand and the Bible in the other. And our job is to put on the theological lens, which we all have, whether we wear purple glasses or not. We come into a church or a religious setting to say, what is the theological understanding of what we are witnessing as we hold a movie and we ha hold our scriptures together. How do they come together? Because I believe actually that's our job. Our job is to be theological reflectors. If someone says, why do you go to church? It's because I'm a theological reflector. I'm seeking to make connections. The movie American Fiction was chosen because it's February and it's Black History Month. And it is important for us to hear and see and know in this month in particular, the stories, movies, and books of black people who share their story and their perspective. It isn't tokenism, I don't think. I think that we are seeking to say, hey, in this month, we are going to pay attention uniquely to these stories. American uh, fiction, is a dramedy. I've never heard that phrase before. But it's a story of a black named, man named Monk, who's an academic from Boston, an upper-class author, who struggles because the stories he tells is, are not selling. And his boss tells him, time to take a break and go be with your family, which he says, that is the worst idea ever if you want to help me. But nonetheless, there's a whole story and stories that could be told about his family. But on his way, as he leaves Boston, he hears the telling of a black female author whose books are selling. You heard her at the beginning. She is writing a story that people want to hear. It's the story of shootings and poverty and crime, just the way we know it is. We want that story, they are told. And he wrestles with the fact that his stories are not being heard and sold, but hers are. And so he decides he's going to play the game and he creates an own new name for himself, Stag, Lay, 
And he begins to tell this story of black people, writing now not about academia or poetry, but about the black story of crimes, of murder, of poverty, just the way we all know it really is. And suddenly, he's offered $750,000 for his book, and he's going, oh my God, I didn't even mean this. He changes the name to the F word, which becomes the title, and he says it hoping they're gonna deny it, and he's sure they're not gonna pick up the title, and sure enough, they say, well, that's exactly the right title for you people, is it not? And so that becomes the book that suddenly goes viral. And he begins to tell this story and he can't believe what he is seeing with his own eyes as he stereotypically speaks about the black story of violence and crime and bloodshed and shootings, just like the white people want to stand up and say, yes, that's the story. The movie is incredibly funny because you see yourself in it. You see yourself as a white person with the stereotypes, witnessing it and seeing the movie make fun of us. So what are the theological connections? I have to begin with a disclaimer. It's odd to have a white elder man and a white older man, privileged white male, stand here and talk about this movie, but I just gotta say that's who I am and I speak my voice in this place that I'm not speaking for anyone here but myself when I speak. And just to, at the beginning, say to you that there's a whole different kind of theology lens as we wear. There is actually a black theology. And people of color write their story, their perspective from the black lens, just as there are feminist writers who put on their lens and speak from the female lens as they look at the biblical stories, just as there are liberation theology people who write with their understanding in Central America about what liberation means when you live in oppression. So we have these different lenses we put on when we come into places like this, and we put those lenses on to help us see better not necessarily to offer us the stereotype, but actually to crack it open and invite us to hear and see another voice because we all come into this place with our own assumptions. So I say that as a disclaimer and recognize that there is indeed a black theology which I have studied and which I am learning to be more familiar with all the time. So what does this movie say? I believe this movie calls us to a wider lens, to bigger glasses, to a different way of seeing the world. And I see this most fully in Paul's writing when he says these words. When I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I put, become an adult, I put an end to childish ways. Now I see in a mirror dimly. Then I shall see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know more fully. You see, all of the theologies are inviting us to see differently, to put on different lenses, to see the multiplicity of the ways in which we might see ourselves and the world. As I said last week, the main goal of religion, Richard Rohr says, is to help people reconnect with their truest self. The whole reason we are here is to reconnect to our truest self, which is already there. It's about seeing ourselves and others and a movie with the eyes that see us as the beloved that we are, no matter what someone has said or done to us. It is about seeing and knowing more fully. The second thing this movie is, is to recognize that as Gord said, we other people all the time. As humans, we have a tendency to other people we don't know, to create a separation between others we do not know by providing labels or stereotypes or seeing them as not me. They would say, theologians, they would say that the greatest illusion we have is that there's a separation between us and the other. And this separation is what we call sin. Because there is really no separation between us. Yes, we're all different and diverse, but it's human to human, human to human. 
The othering is a way in which we tend to say, they're over there, they're a person of color, they're male, they're straight, they're gay, they're old, they're young, they're black, they're rich, they're poor, they're educated, they're uneducated. And all the labels that we quickly place on each other is what we would call othering. And this movie reflects how this is part of our human culture to other people. We have prejudice, all of us. We all have racism. We are all prejudiced in that we prejudge someone without knowing their particular story. It's easy to do to prejudge others and separate it because it creates an order for us to live in that puts people where we want them in their place so that there is separation between us. It's easy to other people because it means you don't have to change when you've othered people. As I thought about this story in this sermon, I thought about my own homophobia. I thought about my own homophobia and the story goes back to when I was 22 years old. In the year 1982, I traveled around the world with a high school friend. We had finished our BA, we saved our money and we began a year long tour of the world hitchhiking. And we began in New Zealand. In that country in 1982, we hitched. And of the 20, 60 nights I was there, I stayed in 26 different homes with people I'd never met. Almost half the time I stayed with people in homes that I didn't know. They all talked about when you picked up, that when you were picked up by them about the one accident that happened 15 years ago as though it was yesterday. But I was picked up and driven as we hitched around our country. But I remembered this particular day in New Zealand. We were picked up by a guy who was single, driving a blue station wagon. And when we walked to get in the car, I looked in the back of the station wagon, there was all kinds of stereo equipment. As we took our ride, he said, I'm going to a hotel and you're welcome to stay with us if you like. We thought, great, we got a bed to stay tonight. He said, it's also got laundry, you're welcome to do your laundry. Yes, we'll do our laundry. So when we got to the hotel, my friend Kirk took all of our laundry and went to put it in the laundry. And as he was doing this, the person I was with who picked us up said, by the way, if you haven't figured it out, I'm gay. And I literally stood there and went, oh my God, what do we do now? And I literally tried to go over and find Kirk and say, get the laundry, get the laundry, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. And Kirk said, it's okay, we'll stay, we'll be okay. We came back to the room and I tried to pretend like nothing was bothering me at all. And he said, I'll take you out for dinner. And I'm like, oh no, I don't think we want, y'all right, we'll go for dinner. And then after dinner, he said, we're in New Plymouth. I wanna take you to the, the peak in this town and show you and I'm thinking, great, we're on our way to get mugged and beat up and we're gonna be killed. And we drove all the way up and I'm clinging to the side of the door, sure that I've gotta jump out at any time. And all these stories are going through my mind. We got back to the hotel room that night and we took all of our bags and I put them against the door because I was sure this person was coming after me. I lied awake all night long, for sure not gonna sleep. We got up in the morning and he said, would you like me to take you to breakfast? And we're like, sure. And sure enough, we went to breakfast and at the end of that, he shook our hands and said, see you later. And in that day, I had so many prejudgments so many fears, so many labels that were all completely false. But the story gets better because Kirk, 10 years later, tells me that he's gay. My high school friend tells me that he is gay. And I married he and Rob 20 years ago in Vancouver. And they've been together 20 years. We laugh about that story. And he surely laughs at me in that story. Do you see how out of our own ignorance and our own prejudice that we label someone we don't know in such a way and the horrific things that we think and the things we say because we just don't know and the othering has put us in that place. And so it's the seeing the other. You saw in the scripture, in Christ there'll be no more male or female Greek or Jew, black or slave, all are free, all are one in Christ. Or in Matthews, 
The call is to love, to see the Christ in our midst. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked and you clothed me. When did you do that? When you did it unto me, Jesus says, to see that there is no otherness, there is only oneness. You see, that's the challenge, to wonder who am I othering right now? Number three, pay attention to what's really going on, as Gord said. Pay attention to see most differently, to recognize our shadow, which is at work. You see, we each project on other people through our false self, what we think they are, or who we think we are to the world. Richard Rohr defines shadow this way, and we all have it. Our shadow is what you refuse to see about yourself and what you do not want other people to see. Behind me, well, not because of these lights, but here's my shadow, it's behind me. And all of us have a shadow, this part of us that we don't want anybody to know. And often we live out of it, often most often in anger. And we need to ask ourselves, who am I really? What am I hiding? What am I putting on somebody else to drag them down? And who am I really going to trust? You see, that's what we do from our shadow. And the shadow usually bites us in the butt. The question we have to say is, what is it about them that I don't like, that I'm angry about, that I call out? And when we have values in this church like hospitality, spirituality, social justice, and risk, are we really, when we say that, how are we going to live fully and honestly in to those values? We all have a shadow, and our work is to do that shadow work. Sometimes our shadow is unconscious and we don't even know it. This is another classic family story. In my family, my other better friend, Clayton Johnston, who lives in Vancouver and Island, we were young together in our 20s and Clayton went off to be a teacher in Bahamas and he met a girl named Peggy and he was gonna marry her so he brought her back to Canada. And here we were sitting at our cottage at this table and Peggy had decided to make a Bahamian fish dish. And so we sat at the table, my father, a United Church minister, and Clayton's another United Church minister. And as we sat at the table, my father says out loud, oh, Peggy, you must have been slaving over this all day long. He ate in quiet. And then Clayton's dad said, dad said, all we need is someone to sing Old Man River, a song about Mississippi and racism in the 1930s, totally unaware, totally unaware, unconscious, because I'm sure they were both saying, don't say anything racist, don't say anything racist, and they said something racist. You see, our unconscious is when we say things from our shadow that we dare not say, but we do. It's about paying attention, paying attention to who we are, who's within us and behind us. Following upward, Richard Rohr writes this, the movement in the second half of life wisdom has much to do with necessary shadow work and the emergence of a healthy self-critical thinking, which allows us to see beyond our own shadow and disguise and to find out who you are, hidden with Christ in God. The self cannot die, it always lives, and it is your truest self. And that's why Jesus said this, why is it you take the plank out of your own eye, and when you take the plank out of your own eye, you'll be able to see the speck in your neighbor's eye? Because we're hypocrites, we need to continually do this. Finally, I want to say this movie and racism for me invites us not to so much our head but to our heart, which is where the arts lie. That in these troubled times we are living in, it is the arts that save us and provide a bond. Whether it is the arts of worship, like the songs of scripture, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or Psalm 139, O oh God, you search me and you know me. You know, when I sit down and when I rise up, you are still with me when I wake up. 
or the song, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or maybe it's in, not in the scriptures, but in the music, like my favorite hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross, a line that always gets me, demands my life, my soul, my all. Or Amazing Grace, a beautiful hymn about a person who was a slave trader and suddenly realizes they've been a slave trader and writes the song, Amazing Grace, I once was lost, but now have found that beautiful song from a slave trader. It's salve. Just like on Friday night when Con Nickel got up and, and saw, sang the song by Blue Rodeo, Lost. Reminding us when we're lost, we're not lost if we are together. You see, in this cultural crisis, it is arts and music that speak truth to us. When I was in Nicaragua in a war in 1986, it was Bruce Coburn. I literally put my earbuds in. Well, they didn't have them back then, but, you know, those things you put in your ear. And if I had a rocket launcher, his song saved me and kept me in the war. When 9-11 happened, I remember our culture listened to the Beatles' Imagine song over and over and over again. Imagine no religion. When I went through a breakup in the year 2000, Leonard Cohen's song, Hallelujah, played over and 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 over again as salvation. 1989, when the young Chinese man stood against the tanks in Tiananmen Square, he became a symbol to me of Jesus standing before violence as he went before the anti-democracy tanks. Or perhaps it's poetry given to me by Doug Schroeder this week. Poetry that speaks, as Andrea says, uh, what do you say? Scripture is what poetry, or is what? Poetry is what theology wishes it could be. Here it is. Poetry is what theology wishes it be. Here's Rumi. Because it's beyond our head. Out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in the grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other. Each other, other. Doesn't make sense. The breeze at dawn has secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sill where two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. Good religion doesn't let you sleep. It's the imagination and the arts that we need in these days, and they are what help us heal and be grounded, to be calm and courageous. Yesterday, I was at Grace Presbyterian Church, and Richard Topping, the principal, was talking about the imagination and preaching. And he talked about the importance of Scripture being about imagination and dreaming. And there's a song that he referenced, and I'm going to show it to you to hear right now by John Legend. It's called Preach. The idea behind the song is that sometimes we can't get so frustrated by the news in the world and what's going on. We don't know what to do. Some people sit back disengaged and ignore the world. Or some do something about it. And he sings in this song, I can't sit and hope. I can't just sit and pray. And he sings this song speaking about gun violence in America. And he says, whenever a massacre occurs, a politician says, we send our hope and prayers to the victims and the families and then do nothing. John says, I learned in Sunday school, you gotta love your neighbor even if they're not your blood. I guess this is why we have to take what we say and sing into the world in transformation. Here's the song and the question of the day. What do you hear in this song? I invite you for one minute to somebody near you. What did you hear? What did you know in that song or sermon? You got one minute.
thank you. I know you're not done. I know you're not done. We're never done in the world. Thank you for listening. Amen. Invite us to our final piece of music. leave to continue your journey, having been in this space, perhaps with theological lens. May you look out to the world and see the world as a place of love. May you look inside yourself and see yourself as beloved, and may that love come alive in your living. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen.